Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Petrina Firth from the APDT and this is another instalment of Train Your Dog Month. And tonight I'm joined by Ellen Greenwood Soul from the Urban Herder. Hi Ellen. Hi Petrina, you okay? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Um, so you love all herdy breeds, right? Yes, all herdy mm -hmm. breeds. I have a particular nonchalant for collies, but most herdy breeds kind of are my bag, really. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's one I've worked with for a while, and I absolutely love working with them. The way that they work, the way their brain works, it, it just is kind of everything that I really enjoy and really passionate about. Yeah, it's not um, it's not a dog, as I'm from the middle of London, that we get a lot of, although we've got quite a few uh, collies chasing cars and things like that. But generally, it's def they're definitely yeah. more of a rural type of dog. So um, I don't have tons and tons of experience with collies, actually, and, and herding breeds. A few corgis, which are always interesting, and shelties and, and things like that. So I'm going to absolutely love watching yeah. your talk. <laughs> well, with like the herding breeds, I live in the north, in case you can't get from my accent. Um, and obviously, we get a lot of collies because there are we're kind of there's towns and then there's loads of rural communities. So we do tend to get a lot of collies that come in from those rural communities, and they they do kind of come into the cities. But I also think certain herding breeds are kind of almost disassociated with herding, like your corgis, your shelties, and things like that. There's kind of a bit of a se separation in there where people don't actually realise how involved the breed heritage is and how much that can actually impact them even though they're not necessarily used as that every day anymore or they're very seldom used in terms of i think there is only like handfuls of people that actually still use shelties and corgis and stuff traditionally in, in the way that they're bred for but they still have those genetic needs and those genetic behaviors that people don't always realize great all right well brilliant um if you're right i'm gonna hand you over to present yeah. your slides and your presentation. If anybody's got any questions, please yeah. feel free to pop them in the chat, say hi, let us know you're watching. And um, we'll come and do a Q&A with Ellen at the end. All right, hi. here we go. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at the herding breeds in the urban environment. Um, Obviously, they're starting to become more and more in the pet homes. And I think it's really important that people understand where they are or who they are and where they kind of come from. But first things first, who are we? So my name's Ellen Coop um, slash Greenwood Soul. I recently got married. Um, I have a degree in applied animal behaviour. I'm an APDT trainer, obviously. I have a diploma in canine behaviour, science and technology, and I am also an IMDT trainer. And all this basically means is I am degree educated, so I've spent a lot of time and effort getting my education, and I go down the science-based route. So I look for evidence and research to support what I do more than anything. Um, the Urban Herder was created due to a Border Collie who is the boy in the bottom corner there with the balls called Jasper. Uh, Jasper was given to me by an elderly couple who just couldn't cope with him. I went on holiday and they were like, we can't cope with this dog, we need someone to take him. I tried to find a rescue for him and fell in love and brought him back. Um, that night he bit my husband <laughs> and the rest is history um, and he was very much a dog that did struggle in the urban environment he was from strong working lines um, he hadn't necessarily had the best start from the breeder and he had ended up in the wrong home so he'd not only got genetic kind of drives um, herding instinct and stuff coming through he also had certain fear and anxiety problems as well he was incredibly reactive. He was worried about life. I always said he was a bit like Chicken Little. The sky was falling. The world was going to end. Um, he was amazing in the house. He was the perfect house dog. The second you stepped out that front door, the world was ending to him. And he was incredibly worried by stuff. Um, he car chased. Um, he was scared of bins. Don't ask me where that came from. Um, he was worried by people. He was dog reactive. He was social, but he was worried. So he would react to stuff quite a lot. Um, and we traveled all over the country together, trying to find trainers and training techniques and things to help him. And in the end, I suppose we did because we got to the point where he was happy we could take him lots of places and he could cope and not only cope but he was happy which is the important thing for us is making sure that not are they, not only are they just coping that they're actually enjoying what we're doing with them 
Um, and in the time together that we had, he came on absolutely leaps and bounds. Um, we He was kind of, unfortunately, he died at quite a young age due to epilepsy. Um, but just before he died, we were kind of really hitting our stride. We were going out and walking around the mountains in the dales and the lakes. Um, we started, we'd entered some training competitions for Heal It to Music, which he loved. We were going to regular classes, again, which he loved. Um, so he kind of... He'd overcome a lot of his issues and was really starting to live almost like a normal dog life. Um, and this is where we started to sort of realise that a lot of collies have similar issues to Jasper, car chasing, reactivity, um, impulsive herding and things like that, being worried by stuff because there's lots of stuff going on for these dogs. Um, and I started to realise that a lot of other herding breeds and other collies have very similar issues to him. Maybe not all at once in the same dog. Um, they might just have one or two of the things that he struggled with. So I started to use some of the stuff that I kind of figured out that worked really well for him um, and started applying it to other dogs. And we kind of, this is where the urban herder came from. It came from him. So although we didn't get much time together because he did die quite young, he's kind of got a little bit of a a legacy to leave and to help other dogs, which is which is really quite nice. So what are collies and other herding breeds bred for? They're bred to control movement is the, is, is the main thing. It's about manipulation and controlling of movement. So a lot of dogs, a lot of collies and other herding breeds, they've been bred to manage their the movement in their environment. Now, this may look slightly different depending on the breed that you have. Um, so for example, collies, they, they like control. They want everything to be under control and they use eye behavior and stalking, which is all to do with the predatory sequence to control that movement. Now, the eye behavior in collies is incredibly unique. A lot of other breeds don't use that predatory eye behavior in the same way. Um, other breeds such as uh, Kelpies and Hunterwears and things like that, they give voice, which means they bark. And what that does is rather than using predatory eye to assert pressure on the stock, um, which then controls the movement, they give voice, so they bark, um, which, and Aussies and things like that, they, they bark, which is why you may see that those types of breeds can be more vocal around stuff. Um, a lot of these dogs, not only have they been bred to control movement, they're bred to be stimulated by it, and not only stimulated, but reactive to it, which is where you can start to see inappropriate herding or inappropriate behaviours come around uh, movement in the environment. So it could be something as simple as cars, um, people running, bikes, skateboards, children, because children are incredibly unpredictable. Um, however, not all movement triggers herding as true herding sometimes um, herding isn't true herding if the emotion and the intent behind it is because a lot of herding breeds can drop into herding behaviors as a coping strategy so when they're worried when they're stressed uh, anxious fearful whatever in the same way we have coping strategies like we might bite our nails we might fiddle with our hair Collies and herding breeds do the same thing they have coping strategies and a lot of the time their coping strategies can be herding so sometimes a collie may come to me with inappropriate herding behaviours, which actually turns out to be something completely different. It might be that the dog is actually worried and they're using that as a strategy. So don't just put a blanket thing on um, controlling of movement as just herding. Sometimes it is a, control, a, a coping strategy. Their breads have really cute hearing. They have to work out and about away from the shepherd. Um, so they do have to have really acute hearing and they have to be able to listen as well as work. So it's kind of that two-prong sensory input where they have ears switched onto the shepherd and eye and focus on the stock um so they have to have that really kind of on, uh, switched on hearing sociability isn't always a huge factor a lot of these dogs traditionally live on a farm farms are incredibly rural places and uh, you generally don't get loads of random people walking through farmyards you generally don't get loads of random unknown dogs walking through farmyards again and um, so sociability isn't always a huge factor for these dogs and you generally find that a lot of collies and things like that can be socially tolerant but they're not sociable um, and they don't necessarily seek out sociability or social interaction they're, they are okay with things being in the environment but they don't seek out that socialness or that social interaction Again, because of the environment they're traditionally kept in, it's that low stimulation to high, where they're generally kept in um, outbuildings, kennels, sheds, wherever, 
where it is very little going on. They're kind of kept away from stuff. So they have that downtime, that decompression time. Um, and then they go out and they have this high stimulation where they have incredible highs of dopamine and adrenaline when they're working and they're doing exactly what they're bred for. But afterwards, they get to go back into that low stimulation environment and have that downtime, which can be a bit of a struggle when you've got a collie that, or a herding breed that comes into um a home when there might be people coming and going all the time there's noise all the time from the tv or the radio or there's other dogs in the home that are moving about and things like that and you may find that they just don't quite get that decompression and that that rest that is actually needed they're independent thinkers but also the other half to a partnership so when you think of a shepherd and a herding breed whatever dog that they work with it is a partnership but it's also there is an element of independence to it so they work at a distance and it kind of depends where the shepherd is coming from so for example if you have a do- uh, some shepherds will literally send their dog out and expect the sheep to be gathered back to them with very little input from them whereas others will if you go more towards trialing they want to control the dog's movement a lot more strictly so that they can get them around the course so depending on how much um and how the shepherd is will depend on how much input the dog will get um, from the shepherd in terms of how they want to handle it. Because some, like I say, some shepherds will literally get the dog off the back of the bike and expect the dog to do most of the work with very kind of little input. Whereas other shepherds will will kind of nail the dog in terms of I want you here, I want you here, you need to stop, you need to lie down, you need to do this and control the movement in a really precise way. And it will also depend on the job that needs doing as well. Um, in terms of whether, like say, in the trialling field, they have to move the sheep around the field in a really sort of specific way. They have to go through certain gates and stuff like that. Whereas if you're just out working day to day, you don't have to have that precision there. And again, farms are generally quiet, unchanging places. So this kind of goes back to that low stimulation, high stimulation. A lot of the times there's not a lot of change um, on farms. Yes, work is seasonal. Sometimes it may be harvesting, it might be lambing, it may be whatever. However, the farm itself and the day-to-day running of the farm is generally doesn't change that much in terms of from the dog's perspective. Um, so sometimes these dogs can be real sticklers for routine and for not changing of routine, um, which again can be quite difficult in the pet environment when we generally don't li- necessarily live in such strict um routines anymore especially since covid with people working from home sometimes working in the office and for me especially i i do not have set working hours it's just the nature of my job um so i have to have dogs that are relatively flexible jasper wasn't particularly a dog that was particularly flexible and i did have to try and keep to a more of a strict or stricter schedule for him but my others now that we don't have him I have a little bit more freedom because they don't need that kind of support. But it's something to consider with your dog, whether actually is it something that my dog needs? Does my dog need routine? Does it make them feel more safe and more secure? So skills for an urban herder. And I think this is really important because I massively go down the route of skills when I train. Obedience is brilliant and there is a need for it, yes. Um, However, I think for a lot of dogs, they actually need skills um, in terms of, like, for example, an ability to switch off, an ability to come in and actually rest and digest what's going on in the day. Sleep is so important for dogs. It's when learn and learn occurs. It's when all those, like, connections are being formed and it's it's really important because dogs who don't get enough sleep especially puppies are kind of like petulant toddlers who haven't had enough sleep where they get grouchy and they are less tolerant and they're kind of just a bit miserable to be around dogs can be the same so making sure your dog is has an off switch and is getting enough sleep is really really important self-control which is a biggie for these dogs the ability to look at something and manage themselves so that they're not just going into that reaction which also brings on to the ability to watch and not react like we said earlier they're not only stimulated but they're responsive to movement and things like that so having the ability which most all working dogs have was the ability to watch sheep and not always chase or not always do things depending on what the shepherd needs and wants in that moment that is a skill that these dogs need so that we can manage this reactivity and things like that basic, basic obedience is good you do need recall you do need things like that a solid sit stay and stuff along those lines but it's not the be all and end all and you can build basic obedience but some of these skills i think kind of gets pushed to the back 
learning to be around other people and other dogs. Now, this doesn't mean actually physically interacting with them, but as a dog living in the urban environment, they are going to be around people and they're going to be around dogs. And your dog has to learn to be okay with that. Like I say, they don't physically have to be interacting with the dog. They do not have to be interacting with the person, but they have to learn to cope with being around them not necessarily interacting with them and I think that's a really key point is you do not have to have a dog that can go up and greet every dog and greet every person because I think that's an unfair expectation however your dog has to be able to be okay to be in the same park as a dog um, even if they're the other end that's okay but they need to be okay with that impulse control again managing themselves making sure that they that if they have an impulse, they don't just act on it straight away, that they can have a little bit of thinking time. And that thinking time is important because we can build stuff into that. Emotional regulation, making sure that they're not getting too frustrated and having nowhere to go, making sure they're not getting too over aroused and having nowhere to go because you can start to see um, behaviours coming in with that. Again, with fear, anxiety and stuff like that as well. Mental stimulation is so important. I would say as important if not more important than physical exercise um these are really really clever dogs um herders are second to none and they will figure things out so quickly but it's making sure that we give them some mental stimulation because these are dogs that could run all day are we going to run them all day no because it's not feasible um but we need to mentally tire them not only physically tire them so looking at things that we can do whether it's trick training scent work herding games um little stuff like that and they don't have to be massive training sessions it could just be five ten minutes at the end of the day physical exercise again is important but i'm going to tell you a secret i don't walk my dogs every day um some days yes they'll go out and they might have two or three hours other days they might get half an hour 20 minutes some days they don't get walked at all depending on what's going on that day uh Aoife, the blue mill in these photos um she has really bad hips so she's having a bad hip day we won't do a dog walk that day again they get mental stimulation but they don't always get that physical exercise and that is okay um and again rest time rest and downtime which brings us back to that off switch making sure that they are getting that because i don't think people realize how important sleep and rest actually is for dogs um, and if you have a dog that isn't getting enough you are likely to see more behavior problems and training issues starting to creep in so herders need a job yeah, they do. These are dogs that have been bred for a job. Um, in the same way that, um, in the same way that, um, brachycephalic, so dogs with squishy, squishy faces and squishy noses, have been bred for um to be extreme in looks. So they have a short space. Um, this has knock-on effects for them in terms of health-wise. Collies and herding breeds have been bred to be at the extreme of behaviours. And again, this has knock-on effects for them if this isn't fulfilled. Um, so it's important that we do create them jobs. When I say jobs, it's, it's a loose title. Um, to prevent them from becoming self-employed. Um, and also, they do need that off switch. So self-employed dogs may start to do jobs that we don't want them to do that become quite inconvenient um, or are not socially acceptable in terms of herding children in the park or herding other dogs which is no fun for the other dog if you're trying to have a nice day out a sniff and then you've got some random collie controlling every movement that you do um, many collies kind of can really struggle especially young adolescent collies can really struggle with becoming self-employed and not getting that off switch and that switch off that they really need so it's really important that we a, provide them with suitable appropriate jobs things that we that fit into your lifestyle and with your dog um, and we also teach them how to switch off and we give them space and support to do that so benefits of giving your job your herder a job it boosts their confidence it gives them like a sense of purpose almost um, creates a strong bond between you and your dog which is a biggie for me spending time um, with your dog and it being constructive and positive time is really important mentally ties them out which brings them back to that mental enrichment making sure we're mentally tiring our dogs can reduce boredom dogs who are bored generally get up to mischief so if they are not bored we then will see a reduction in behaviors that we wouldn't like such as biting digging um 
for some collies, it may be repetitive behaviour types, such as shadow chasing or things like that. Um, and again, reduction in inappropriate or unwanted behaviours. So jobs for urban herders. What can we do with our dogs? Scent work. Scent work is a big it. I do it massively with ether. One of the things that I really like about scent work um, is the fact that dogs have full agency when they're working. In the terms of what is different with um trick training and things like that which i also really quite like is we're constantly telling the dog what to do however like i said earlier Eva has bad hips um so she a lot of the time would do those tricks and things but you could tell it kind of was tweaking her and she was doing it because she wanted to work but she wasn't physically capable of doing it properly so with scent work she has complete agency and in terms of she completely can choose how slow how fast whether she goes up on something whether she doesn't how she works she has complete so it's really really good for dogs that are getting a little bit older or have um pain or injuries or anything like that um and it can be great as well for dogs if they have um anxiety or they struggle to switch off because it gets their nose working and kind of switches their eyes off um Scent work doesn't have to be fancy. You do not need to have your dog on a scent and you do not need to be doing lots of um, like freeze indications or anything fancy like that. It could just be as simple as finding your toys or even finding food, but just make sure we're getting their nose working and they're not just looking for stuff with their eyes. Trick training. Trick training is something that I love to do with my dogs. Um, it's something that I personally really enjoy. And again, it really gets their mind working ball games and play so when i say ball games ball games can be a bit of a um uh, can be um a bit of a trigger word for some people because people think when you say ball games that you mean mindless ball flinging and that is kind of the complete opposite of what i mean mindless ball flinging is kind of it's counterproductive yes it physically tires them but it's that repetitive behavior which is really really hard on their joints and it's also kind of the opposite of what collies and herding breeds are bred for. Collies and herding breeds are bred to control movement. And having a ball constantly thrown out of control is the opposite of that. Majority of collies and herding breeds, the bit that they like in that sequence is the bit where they brought the ball back and they put it at their feet. And they're looking at the ball. The ball is under control. And the shepherd, the owner, is between, is the ball is between the shepherd and the dog. However, the shepherd or the owner generally picks up the ball and flings it out of control. And again, we have out of control movement, which a lot of collies, it builds this element of frustration and adrenaline, which you can end up then with collies who become addicted to the ball throwing. So, and then you end up with like an unhealthy obsession with the ball because they're looking for that dopamine hit, that adrenaline hit, but then you also have that frustration and conflict coming in. So when we use balls and when we use toys, we use them in specific ways. So we look at building skills such as impulse control, frustration tolerance, look at building um, control around movement. So teaching our dog to be able to do these behaviours while there's movement going on. Um, and we also do lots of urban herding. So sheet balls is a big one that we also play with a lot of our clients. And enrichment. And enrichment is so much more than a lot of people give it credit for. It isn't just another way to feed your dog. It's a way of mentally stimulating your dog. Um, and it's getting their brain working and also tired. So it can be food based. It can also be toy based. And it's just sometimes it's as simple as getting their kibble and rolling it up in a towel. It can be that simple or it can be more convoluted and more difficult. Um, it just kind of works on what you're capable of doing at that moment with your dog. It doesn't have to be massively time inducing. So, urban herding, what is that? This is a video.
hazel there, plain sheep balls. Um, and you can see she is using all her natural herding behaviours there. She's flanking, she's stalking, she's able to stop and control movement, which is makes for one really fulfilled and happy collie. Um, I'm just going to leave you with our podcast, which is called Talk Herdy to Me um, by the Urban Herder, obviously. Um, and it's not just collies. There are other herding breeds that are discussed on it. We've recently uh, recorded an episode that's a little bit about Dutch Shepherds, which is really good. Um, but it's a free resource for you. And we have lots of different topics on there from puppyhood to adolescence to um, aggression to all these different topics to help you and your herding breed um, kind of overcome some of your issues. And like I say, it's completely free. So if any of you are looking for more help with your collies or with your herding breed, please check it out because um, there will be an episode there that will be able to help you with something. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've uh, rushed through that a little bit. Um, but yeah no that was excellent thank you Ellen um, I've seen a little bit of sheep balls but I've never quite seen it done the whole way through like you had it there and do different colour balls represent different things for the collies or no um, that's just what we bought what you've got um, okay the behavior, that's just what we have um, so what we look for is eventually we want to start working the dog where we're not with the ball, where we can sort of direct them to the balls and things like that. Um, but it's also looking at um, the technicality of it. So looking at getting square flanks where their head moves first and then their body moves. So you can start to get quite technical with it um, in terms of making sure that it isn't just the dog working through the motions. It is also them doing technically the right the right motions when they do it if that makes sense and is it just i don't i don't mean it like that like just but is it it's just a game that you play with your dog or is it is there a competitive nature to it is there a league of sheep balls no. or anything like that like i'm thinking no, of tribal at time, no at this moment in time it is non-competitive um mm -hmm. so it's just something to do for fun with your collie and enjoy them and sort of see them in their element and look at them doing what what they're bred for if that makes sense mm -hmm. so in terms of tri-ball versus sheep ball tri-ball is more, more operant in terms of you teach the dog to push the ball to move the ball to 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 move it in a really more operant way whereas this works off instinct um if that makes sense where it's looking at getting the dogs to do the behaviours they're bred for in a more traditional sense, rather than moving a ball around and us saying left, right and stuff like that. Mm. Um, it's looking at getting the true innateness of the dog to be able to express their behaviours rather than us saying move left, move right, if that makes sense. So theoretically, any breed of dog could do tri ball and does do tri ball, but sheep ball has been specifically designed for border collies because of the way that they work. And do you find that using a game like that allows them to show that breed expression and stops the problem behaviours that you might see? It doesn't necessarily stop the problem behaviours, but it gives them an outlet for it. So you are mm. less likely to see it. Um, but you can also use the game to build valuable skills, such as learning to lie down around movement um, and building, like, for example, the lie down behavior, so the stop behavior, then being able to stop and lie down while they're in that state of arousal and herding, which can be a big issue for a lot of colleagues is once they start, the owners can't get them back or can't stop them. Mm. So you can teach valuable skills through the game, which is useful for a lot of colleagues, like, for example, teaching them that'll do, which is move away, come, come with me, it's finished. So being able to recall your dog away from opportunities to herd and things like that so you can use the game for so much more than just giving them an outlet it's teaching them valuable skills that are useful for any any herder i suppose perfect great um just gonna have a quick look at the comments um i think kathy said earlier um describing my dog i'm her fourth home she's living failed sheepdog life in somerset well that sounds quite nice yeah that sounds ideal yeah um be positive said i'm starting to get into hoopers great for young and old collies i have a six month and a 12 year old which love it mental and physical do you have any thoughts on hoopers have you given it a go any yes so i am a hoopers trainer 
for Canine Hoopers UK. Um, I'm also a platinum member for UK Hoopers. Um, I got into Hoopers because of Aoife, who is this Millie Mill here. Um, and the reason I got into it over something like agility is it's much more natural movement, much more free flowing. Um, whereas agility is it's lots of tight turns um, and things like that, which for me, with her having her hip issues, she couldn't do. Whereas hoopers is flat work, so there's no impact, no joint uh, jumps or anything like that. Um, and it's nice big sweeping movement, which feeds into everything Collie's been uh, bred for. It's that nice big wide open sort of circular movements almost like a flank um which is why i think collies should and, and do excel at it in an amazing fashion um, if that makes sense so i think hoopers is bits of some of their traditional work patterns coming into um some of the stuff that you see in hoopers so again hoopers is brilliant for collies again you don't have the impact so it's great for young and old um even dogs who are crippled like peefy yes mm. like you um so you don't have to have that impact and it's something that you can do with your dog to have a good time and it's about that distance work again which is again very similar to more traditional work where the shepherd generally stays relatively stationary and the dog goes out and does the work excellent yeah i love hoopers because it's done on the flat um for that reason the low impact and it's really good for teaching distance handling so you can be a really lazy uh, instructor as in you're instructing your dog to do things if you can teach them distance handling so yeah I love yes, you. I mean, that's what these dogs are bred for is that distance mm. handling in terms of very very not very often would you see a shepherd running along after the dog in fact you'd never see it in particular the only time you may see it is if they were on a quad but the dog mm. would be working out in front and doing the behaviors and um, so hoopers feeds again into that natural ability to be able to do that great um just some comments Susanna said brilliant advice there love the idea of sheep balls great um Laura we've answered your question I think about how do sheep balls differ to tribal um yeah just started learning sheep ball but Finn loves it um Sarah's got a question Ellen any tips for how to get people to put the ball away I find so many collie owners love the fact that their dog is obsessed by the tennis ball and use it to get their dog's attention in almost every situation. Recall, wave ball, lunging at traffic, hold up ball, the dog out, chuck ball over and over again. I find it hard to wean the owners off their ball. It's like a security blanket, isn't it? Any tips, yeah. Ellen? Um, this is a thing that I always, I liken it to like a dummy. It's a management for a lot of owners in terms of the amount of collies that I see that the owners go out with a ball slinger and that is their only way from what i can see of them managing their dog's behavior because without that their dog would be left to their own devices and i don't think they would like it so they do use it and as a management and it's almost like i hate to say it but like lazy lazy ownership they would rather manage their dog with a ball flinger than actually train the dog through situations and there are there is time and place for management yes 100 percent. but it's kind of thinking what can we do outside of the box so a lot of the time it's kind of looking at ways that we can still use the ball so i never get rid of the ball but i look at ways that the owners can use the balls in a more effective fashion um so Aoife, Aoife, when i first got her i knew very little i was a newbie dog trainer and i played a lot of ball with her this was before we got her diagnosis um and she is obsessed with the ball she is one of those i, I call her a re recovering ball addict um because we have done a lot of work around it but she still has that she loves it and it's a really powerful tool but it's using it in an effective way that is beneficial to both the owner and the dog um, so a lot of the time we will still use balls with clients like that. However, it's looking at how we use it. So rather than mindless ball flinging, we, we put it away. It is out of sight. The dog does the behavior. And as a consequence of doing the behavior, the ball appears rather than a fling, it's a toss and catch. So it's control of movement. They get to stop the movement. Um, looking at using it in that way or looking at walking along and building in scent work where they'll drop it behind them and send the dog back to sniff for it rather than chase, stop suddenly, impactful, and then run back. So I never, for people like that, because they, they, they are quite attached to it, and it is, again, like a safety blanket of having that ball is their safety blanket to be able to go, Bruno, come back, quickly. Um, I generally don't try and get them rid of it 
completely. I will wean them off of it. I explain the negatives of using it in the way that they do use it and look at alternative ways to use it, whether it is setting up a mini game of sheet balls of dropping the ball at the feet and doing a, a really short mini version of sheet balls uh, with just one ball or whether it is the toss and catch version or whether it is the scent work version. I still have it as a training tool and a training aid, but I will not um, use it in a mindless flinging fashion. Mm, great. Hopefully, hopefully that's answered your question. Um, Laura had the same sort of comment as me, which was uh, Hoopers is also great for those of us that don't stand a hope of keeping up with our dogs. <laughs> yeah, I have absolutely, even Eves with all her hip issues, I couldn't keep up with. Absolutely <laughs> not. So fast. Um, we've got a little question from... Um, Denise over on YouTube who says I have a nearly two year old border collie and three months ago he came off a field to chase a car it was raining heavily and now he goes berserk at some loud cars mainly in the rain any help please so that sounds really contextual and I would potentially be looking at sound as a potential trigger um also try and keep a diary of it I know you've identified rain but start looking at types of vehicle as well because sometimes um it can be really specific with some dogs. So Piper, um, she had a phantom pregnancy and she started car chasing through fear um, in her phantom pregnancy. One of her big triggers is buses, specifically because we walked past a bus and it released the air and went Psss. And that for her is a big thing. She's not so bad with buses moving, but buses stopped at a bus stop, big issue. Not so much anymore, we've worked through it. Um, but it's making sure keeping a diary and being able to identify whether there are, it is all cars, whether it's big cars, little cars, electric cars, um, 4B4s. Do you know what I mean? I've had, I've had clients in the past whose dog only react to white vans. Um, so it's looking at trying to keep figure out what the triggers are, then looking at the distance at which your dog can cope um, with the training that you want to be doing and then thinking about okay well what is driving it so like i said earlier a lot of collies can drop into herding as a coping strategy it's not true herding majority of car chasing collies i see it's actually a coping strategy it isn't that they want to control the car's movement it might be that the car is scary because it's loud and unpredictable it might be the fact that um it is movement in the environment that they can't control and that creates frustration and anxiety. It could be that they, like I said with Piper, she had a negative experience, a big pss went off next to her and, and that scared her. Um, so I'd be trying to figure out why your collie is doing the behaviour. Is it herding or is it a symptom of something else? Is he herding because of something? Um, if that makes sense. Um, and then I would start, depending on why he was doing it, that would be depend on how I would approach it. If it is just purely control of movement, needing to herd, I would start working around skills around that, looking at teaching him the ability to have movement and not respond to it, look at teaching a really solid emergency stop and things like that. If it was because he's worried or anxious or something along those lines, I would be looking at desensitization, building his confidence and Thing and sort of counter conditioning him to it, but it would depend as to why he's doing it as to my approach to it. Great, hopefully that's answered your question, Denise. Let us know if you need any follow up on that. Um, Karen, a bit uh, similar story to you. Um, my border collie is so scared of buses, the air brake hiss in particular. She hits the deck and can't move until it's gone. Yeah, it's incredibly overwhelming in terms of buses. I find anyway are incredibly overwhelming, they're huge. They make a lot of noise. They're quite overbearing in terms of they're very long. They're generally, if they're next to the pavement, they're up close, so there's no mm. space to get away. And that air brake, it scared the absolute bejesus out of Piper. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been something that it is a bit of an ongoing thing um, because that started her car chasing. So she then generalised it to cars and other things like that. Um, we've worked through it. She now lo no longer car chases and she doesn't do because uh, it was vans as well she doesn't do vans or anything like that but it is we still have issues around um the buses and walking next to a bus that is next to a bus stop because that's when it happened um she is getting a lot better but luckily it's a very kind of it's very seldom that we're in that situation so it's kind of one of those things i haven't fully eradicated because it doesn't come up particularly very often in our day-to-day -day life 
and um, so I've had other things to be working on because of how we live but if there is that massive fear it is again it's working on desensitization and counter conditioning but it's making sure you're not moving too quickly because what you can end up doing is sensitizing which basically means you make it worse um so what we want to do is make sure that you're moving at the speed of your dog and not the speed you think your dog should be moving which is what i think a lot of people can fall into where they either start making progress at a certain speed and expect to maintain it which as anybody knows with training training is not linear you end up having ups and downs step setbacks and stuff like that um or if you're anything like me and you're a pushy trainer because i am a pushy trainer um i'm like oh my dog's doing well i'll keep going i'll keep pushing it i'll keep pushing it and i end up pushing it too far and my dog ends up having a fit or struggling um and it's my fault because i pushed it and it's something that i've had to be very aware of with myself is how much i push it we were having this discussion at the weekend with Eva's um scent work trainings we're building her indication and i'm very very aware that i'm a pushy trainer um and this is a thing i've had to start sort of being really more aware of myself in terms of when i'm training because of this so it's something to think of especially if you have a dog who is intensely fearful but for the time being you might be worth trying to avoid it and letting them have some decompression time as well just to kind of mm. get it get down to baseline get it, and then start fresh yeah great um i think kind of comment along the same lines really um Denise said, mine is that bad. I can barely, barely walk her now. I was working on getting her closer, but even in the middle of a field, she loses her marbles at anything. People, dogs, cars in the distance. She pulls barking and hurts my arms. I yeah, think that probably really might... Because if you've got a dog that is that extreme and they're living in a city or somewhere like that, the problem is they never get that decompression. They never get that break. If that is the state they're getting themselves into on every single walk, you're never gonna get particularly far because they're constantly in that state. Whereas ideally, if they got into that state, sorry, my dog is licking his ball now. Um, if they're constantly getting themselves into that state, they're constantly on the back foot with stuff. They never kind of get over the cortisol and, and the stress of it. So it would be kind of thinking, okay, well, what can I do to try and minimize that? Do I need to start hiring dog fields so that we can have walks where we can just work on the training? Because you need to get basic training in there when there's nothing in the environment to then be able to apply it when there are triggers. But if you're never capable of being in an environment where there's no triggers, then you're never capable of getting the basic training in there. So it might be looking at, okay, well, do we need to hire a, a, a um a dog field somewhere where we know we can go and be safe and give my dog that time to be a dog without the pressures of potentially being a person or another dog or something that they struggle with um if that makes sense as well great um and rosie has got a question my 18 month old collie is reactive to animals barking lunging and will currently charge deer and horses if off lead working really hard on disengagement and building value in us is it possible to overcome yeah 100 percent 100%. I would never say I would 100% trust my dogs like around livestock and stuff. I would not have my dogs off lead in a field with sheep or something like that because they're not my sheep, not my not my place to do it. Um, however, we have been really successful with working on um, like a down to movement. So when there's movement in the environment, my dogs clap down. Um, working on having a really solid um, lie down or emergency stop behavior as well. So for example, if they do give chase, I'm able to um, say lie down and they will just clap down. Um, Piper, again, through her phantom pregnancy, she started chasing birds um, and we worked on again, that disengagement and stuff, but making sure that the reinforcement was right. So a lot of people try and use food and stuff like that, but a lot of dogs or collies, herding breeds, when they're in that state, they can't take food. Um, they're not in the right emotional state or part of the predatory sequence to take food. So I started combating chasing with chasing. She would look at the things she wanted to chase, which for her was birds. She would have to disengage and she would get opportunity to chase, but chase a tuggy with me. So I was giving her an outlet for the behavior she wanted to do, but in with me in a safe and controlled fashion. And she'd have a successful chase. Whereas if she chased the bird, the bird would fly away and she would never get a catch and a follow through um, and a lot of the time once you get kind of a little bit of that arousal and stress out with the tuggy or the chase behavior they will then start to take food and you can work on the arousal through stuff like that um but for a lot of these dogs i'd be looking at also doing side work around 
impulsivity around movement, looking at building a clap down or a lie down behavior or something like that and being able to have so working with float poles or tuggies and things along those lines to be able to have that control around movement um and then build into things like fear rabbits whatever it is that your dog is struggling with birds in our case <laughs> <laughs> great and uh, and denise just had a follow-up comment saying Thank you. I'm currently doing desensitising as fear is fear as he cowers and keeps looking back as he knows it's coming behind him. That was about the um, air brake on the bus. Yeah, it's yeah. bigger, noisy vehicles, but seems OK when they're at a distance. That says... so that sounds incredibly similar to Piper. And like mm -hmm. I said, we've got over the majority of it. She still has her moments. Um, but like I said, for us, it's not a massive factor. So we've had other things to work on, um, but it's it, keep working at it. Um, and make sure that you're giving your dog, if you find that they have a really bad day, give them a decompression day for the next day or two to let them just have a bit of time. Don't just hammer working on this all the time because it's not fair on your dog to every walk to be put in those situations. Make sure they are having time to just be a dog and sniff and, and just do dog stuff rather than just constantly working around their fears. Great. And Laura's just got a nice little comment saying, a fab talk, Ellen, thank you. It was a rescue collie that started my training journey. I then went on to have others and foster problem collies with bite histories. They all taught me so much, but I wish I'd known them what I know now. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Oh, don't, I always think that with PP, I made so many mistakes with Aoife. Um, I could literally write a book on it. There's so many stuff that I've kind of had to unpick and undo with Aoife because of, I think views I had of collies at the time which were naive or they've come from because a lot of the collie books and stuff are written by farmers from a farming perspective of and they're not written from a pet owner kind of perspective um so it's kind of understanding how some of those traits that make them such amazing work dogs and farm dogs actually translate into urban pets because mm. it's not always as linear as you think the translation would be yeah and a lot of people get collies from farms and then pop them in a three bed semi and they're like, oh, they're from a farm, but we're not going to work sheep with them. And the collie's like, yeah. I've got other ideas, actually. <laughs> yeah. And even like people who buy collies from pet dogs, they're only one pet one. They're, they're still farm dogs. Yes. They were from a farm, but they're in a pet farm. So it's still a farm mm. collie. It's just a farm collie in a pet one. Um, if that makes sense. So like I've recently, I recently had a litter of myself, uh, myself, even though they were pet collies, they were from working stock. And I made mm. that very clear to people getting one of my boys. I was like, these are not like couch potato dogs. They've come from a working mother and a working father. They are working line collies still, even though they have been born and raised in a pet home and I've done puppy culture and I did as much as I could to prepare them for life and make nice, resilient, confident puppies, they have still come from working lines. So you will still massively have genetic factors. And I get videos through all the time of them and I can see either their mum or dad in them straight away. And it's little stuff that they do or the owners will say, oh, well, they're not bothered in balls. So... Piper doesn't care for balls. She cares for the dog chasing the ball. Um, <laughs> and the boys, none of them really play ball. But what they do is they play or they heard the dog playing with the ball. And I'm like, that is, and they message me like, oh, I can't, they don't want to play fetch. I'm like, first of all, please don't start doing that. Second of all, that is their mother coming through and through. That's where that's come from. That is, it is what it is. Mm. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, and Denise just said, thank you. I will keep going. He's such a lovely boy at home. Just a fruitcake outside. <laughs> that sounds like Jasper. <laughs> it was oh. like chicken little in the house. He was the perfect dog. The second he walked out the front door, the sky was falling. The world was ending. He couldn't go. Oh. But he did, like I said, we did so much with him. And towards the end, he lived such a fulfilled life. We could go out walking in the mountains. We could take him on holiday to the seaside. He could do so much. And he was, like I said, he was happy doing it, which for me is the most important thing because there was a point in his training where he could do it, but he was on edge. And we worked through that and we got him to the point where he could do it and be happy at the same time, which is the important thing, is making sure that not only can they do it, but they're also happy and content and confident in doing it. It was not we're just putting them in a situation and 
they're like they're there they're not responding but they're just completely shut down or overwhelmed um if that makes sense so a quiet mm. collie or a non-reacting collie doesn't necessarily mean a happy collie mm, yeah perfect okay thank you so much ellen that's all the questions and comments gone through have you got anything else that you want to add um no, you can find I, out you can give yeah, your so, uh, name of your podcast and your website again yeah, like you say, we have the talk heard to me podcast where we have special guests coming on um we've done different topics about like herding breeds and children um aggression agility lots of different stuff we've got some really good stuff coming up about like for example scent work we've got um some farmers coming in and talking about collies in a more traditional setting and how they kind of their approach to stuff and how they see collies and how stuff like that which is a really nice one uh, we also have our collie collective which is an online subscription service where you get access to us we do monthly webinars and uh talks about different topics which you guys can pick we also have a plethora of um modules and stuff to work through for car chasing teaching the off switch engagement focus we've got some new modules coming out about building that um stimulation to movement and building those clap downs and things like that and um, that which will be released in the next month or so um, and again, we do workshops all around the country. So if anybody wants any help or wants to learn sheet balls or anything like that, drop us a message and hopefully we'll be coming somewhere relatively near you. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions after this, please just drop us a message. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you very, very much. Um, and that just leaves me to say that um, we're back tomorrow at six o'clock. We've got some armchair training. So if you like sitting in your chair at home, and or for whatever reason you are sat in a chair <laughs> um we've got jude irvine apdt member coming on to talk to you about how you can train your dog from the comfort of your armchair so tune in at six for that thanks very much thanks for listening thanks for coming ellen thank you